Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. Today, uh, Reverend Michael had set the theme for the month of June to be divine integration. And um, he'll be treating this each week in a different way. Today, um, he called this lesson, um, All Things Work Together for Your Good. And so um, I'm taking up the baton and um, bringing this from the perspective of, of recognizing that what divine integration means in this experience is that as human beings, we root the, um, the connection with the divine into the physical expression on, um, in the world and through us and through our hearts and through our minds, through our words, through our actions, through the energy that we share with the, with the world. And in doing so, we become what we've referred to as a co-creator with the divine. And in this, this integration is a way of using our minds, the desire of our hearts, and all to bring greater good into expression and it's easy for us to get confused about what it is that I think would be good for the world and that I'm trying to exercise my ego in the world. And so making those distinctions between what is truly the higher thought and what is merely my ego desire is always the work of our spiritual life. And so um, what can often happen as we are attempting to move through these things and we face the obstacles that come, because I'm sure when you heard the title, all things work together for your good, Karen, are you sure about that? And um, I can tell you, yes, I am, because if it has come, it is a part of the answer, that whatever those obstacles appear to be, the things we can't pray away, the things that we wouldn't wish on anyone else. I mean, I know you have those in your history. You have those in your life. And I know that you also, if you have, also know the blessing that has come from having tangled with them, worked them the best you could with the tools you had at the time, and you are more today because of that experience, no different than the one you will now face whatever that obstacle is or whatever that challenge is. We do fall into the pattern sometimes of what is referred to as spiritual bypassing. It's a, it's a, a cute term, but it actually is a way in which we attempt, or our egos attempt, to navigate the undesirable, the, the painful, the, um, the, dis, the dis uncomfortable things that bring us discomfort, or things we don't want to know, or things we don't want to see in our lives. And we can do one of two things. We can slap a happy face on it and try to walk through it and pretend like, uh, you know, I'm just going to affirm my way out of feeling that, knowing that, or dealing with that, or that person. Or um, one of my favorites, uh, spiritual bypassing tools, is to elevate 10,000 feet or 10,000 years, take your pick. So 10,000 years from now, what will mean, this have meaning? And I can, I can diss it or dismiss it, or I can try to, try to put it in some kind of perspective. Or I can lift myself above it and say, you know, in spirit, everything is already done. It's already complete. It's already peace. And therefore, I will descend to peace now and bypass having to actually go through this. That doesn't last very long because the truth is it doesn't go away. And the truth is, it is the way. The only way I can experience that peace is to move through and with and incorporate what is happening. Right now, we're going through quite a change. We are going through, I call it an awakening. A, 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 a transformation, an opportunity 
that is, has such magnitude that the world is feeling it. And as we have gone through some of the um, experiences of, of, and the effect of the death of George Floyd, and seeing the consequences and what it has awakened and what, it has, a, a, what has arisen from it, wherever we are in that path of, 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 of working with it and feeling it, I remind us that as spiritual beings, everything has come to move through us and that it is only in feeling that we heal. It is only uh, in love that we evolve. And so at, however it is that we can go into our hearts and allow it to be broken open and allow the confusion and the pain and the uh, questions to arise, can there be healing and change and growth and evolution In, a, in awareness of that this week, and knowing that George Floyd is a Houston boy, a man who has been a part of this community, he is ours in this way. And we are having um, the opportunity to um, host his um, memorial and burial here in our church at Unity, we are planning to have a recognition and a, a memorial of his life and meaning in a candlelight vigil Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock, live stream. Hope that you'll be able to join us there. In knowing the importance that this is and the ways in which we are growing, I'd like to um, bring to you a, a quote from... Dr. Martin Luther King. We are tied together in the single garment of destiny. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. And whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. This is why now the thing that changes our hearts, the things that, that bumps up against us, that makes us uncomfortable, the thing we would maybe not want to deal with but must, this is the time that is most important for us to walk together and to do our own internal work. And as we do so, know beyond the shadow of a doubt that everything that changes us Everything that changes us changes the world. This is our opportunity. And so I want to tell you a story. And the story today is from the book of Esther. It's in the Bible, not well known perhaps, but it is a beautiful story. And it begins with um, um, King Xerxes, who is the king of Susa, Persia, and his uh, queen Vashti who after a lot of celebrating uh, with all of his guy friends, all of his uh, officials, and after a, a lot of feasting and drinking and falling out, he summons his, his queen to join them, and she refuses to come. And because she refuses to come, the other officials suggest to the king that perhaps he needs, to, uh, he needs to deal with this because this sets a bad example for the rest of the kingdom and, they, uh, and their uh, men's uh, control over their own households. And so because of that, he decides he will depose Queen Vashti and put on a search for a new queen. Now, this isn't why I'm telling you the story, but this is the setup. And so in finding a new queen... Mordecai, who's a Jew in the kingdom, hears of this, and he has been caring for his cousin, Esther, who's a beautiful young woman whose parents had died. And so in caring for her, he hears of this opportunity and the call out for beautiful young women to come and um, be considered for the, this position as new queen. And so he brings uh, Esther there. She finds favor with the king, and lo and behold, because the book is called the Book of Esther, he chooses her. And so because he chooses her, we can move on with the story. So far, so good. 
She is queen. And Mordecai has not abandoned her. He's very concerned about her. So he places himself at the gate, at the palace gates, to keep an ear out and an eye out for her well-being. He also had told her in this vetting process not to reveal that she too is a Jew because he did not want her to um, suffer the, um, the consequences of that revelation or to be dismissed from the possibility of becoming queen as a result. And so it isn't known in the palace. And so he keeps an eye out for her, and in the process of that, he overhears a plot to assassinate the king by some two guards, and he reports it to Queen, uh, to queen Esther, and she tells the king, and an investigation happens, and sure enough, it's proven to be true, and the two are executed. Pin that. That will be relevant later. And so as, the, um, as this continues, enter Haman, Haman the villain. Haman comes, and Haman is um, the right-hand man of King uh, Xerxes. And King Xerxes has given him his signet ring. He has given him authority and power. He has made him second in command in the entire kingdom. And with that came a, a lot of the, uh, the officials in the court would bow down to um, to Haman wherever he appeared. But at the gate, this one man, Mordecai, refused to do so. And when he was asked by some of the guards why he doesn't do that, whenever he sees Haman go by, everyone else is bowing, he says, I'm a Jew, and I don't believe in that. I worship one God. And so that gets back to Haman, and it just irks him. This is the one guy he wants to see humbled in front of him, and it doesn't happen. And so he takes care of it in his own mind. He makes a plot to eradicate all the Jews in the kingdom. He now has this ring of the king. He can send out an edict. And so he prepares to do that. And as he does, he sends out the edict that will, on a particular day, a lot is thrown, and a day is chosen when the entire community of Jews in the kingdom will be killed all. And so the edict goes out and all of the Jews everywhere tear their robes, put on sackcloth, kneel in ashes. They are mourning and grieving this terrible, terrible calamity. Mordecai does the same thing outside the palace gates and he sends word to Queen Esther and tells her this terrible thing that's about to happen. He says, go to the king and beg for mercy and beg for the good of your people. And she tells him that she can't do that because she is not allowed to present herself to the king unless he calls her. And that if she should do so, she could lose her life immediately if he's not in a good mood and waves her in and hands her the golden scepter. And this is what Mordecai says. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he said, Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. You have been placed in this role. It reminds me of the story of Joseph. Michael has shown, uh, has told so beautifully, excuse me, so beautifully before, because he too was put into a position, second only uh, to the Pharaoh, able to save not only his family, but all of his community because of that. And once again, Esther has been given this opportunity. She thinks about it, and she sends a reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, and Fast for me. Do not eat or drink or for three days, night or day, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Now Haman sets up a place of execution 
for Mordecai. He has decided that he is going to bring his complaint and um, his lack of following the rules. He finds a way to do this. And in the information that Mordecai shared in his communication with Esther, Mordecai had also gathered that Haman had not only set up this plot to kill the Jews, he had also contributed a sizable sum of money to the royal treasury. In other words, in some ways, he had bought um, out this opportunity to rid the kingdom of the Jews. And so Esther knows this, and she sets a banquet, and she calls a banquet together, but only the king and Haman are brought. And so in this, she also, um, she also sets up an opportunity to bring her case to the king. Now, the night before the banquet, the king it can't sleep, and so he calls uh, the um, attendants to bring the annals, of the, <clears throat> of the message, of, of the history of his reign. Um, you can imagine how boring that must be, and that was a way for him to be read to so he could go to sleep. I would think we would all like a, a long, boring history that we could just pull out when we can't sleep. So he has it read to him, and it comes across the place where Mordecai had given the word about the plot to kill him, and he goes, was this man ever honored? And they say, uh, no, as a matter of fact, he wasn't. And so soon after that, in the morning when he wakes up, Haman is waiting, can't wait to come and talk to, um, can't, can't, and talk with him and, and give him the sense of what it is that Mordecai has done and, and to order Mordecai's execution. So the king asks Haman, when, as soon as he sees him, he says, what should be done for a man that the king would like to honor? What do you think he should have? And Haman's thinking to himself, well, who else would he want to honor but me, right? And so he goes, well, let's see. I think he should be placed in the robe that the king himself has worn. And he should be seated upon a horse that the king himself has ridden with a, with a crest uh, on, the, on its forehead. And he should be carried, taken, led through town upon this horse, wearing the robe, so that everyone can know this is what happens when a man has found favor with the king and take him all the way through town. And the king goes, excellent idea. Find the man Mordecai and make this so. Make sure that every one of those details are done. And so Haman has to go and get the robe, and get the horse, and place him on it, and walk through the town lauding the man he really wanted to be executed. But that's not why I'm telling you the story. <laughs> and so this happens, and now immediately thunderstruck by this, and now he realizes that there is no way he's going to get Mordecai executed. He's called to the banquet that Queen Esther has prepared, and in that, Queen Esther then laments to her king that not only has she been sold, at, but all of her people, because she too is a Jew. And the Jews, there's a plot against the Jews to take her and all of her people and kill them. She's basically presenting it as your queen is being, um, is, is being threatened here, and there is a man dastardly, uh, planning this near to you in your kingdom. And he's enraged, the king is, and he says, who could this be? And he says, well, she says, it's none other than Haman right here at your very table. And so he storms out. Of course, it's over for Haman. Haman um, begs for mercy, but uh, he is executed. And that's not why I'm telling you the story. But, um, but here's what happens next. Because, uh, so, so Mordecai then takes over the place where Haman had all of the power, and Mordecai is raised to this position because Queen Esther tells the king who he really is to her, and also he's already been honored because he thwarted a plot. So now he has the signet ring, and he has command, and all of Haman's estate, and he has power, money, he's got everything. 
And so they're now worried about this edict. It's gone out. You know when you send an email out, how it just goes everywhere, and you don't even know who shared it with who, shared it wherever? Have you ever tried to retract one of those? It doesn't really work. Somebody still thinks this is going to happen or I should still be doing this. And so the same thing with the King's Edict. Once it went out, it was out. There's no retracting and saying, oh no, we're calling it off. There's none of that. And so instead, what they had to do was send a new edict out. And Mordecai wrote it and sent it out on behalf of the king, basically allowing, and let me give you the wording here just so that you see how it was written. The new edict says, it grants the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them and their women and their children, and to plunder the property of their enemies. And when the day of the attack came, the Jews assembled and fought back. And as they did, they, they, um, they vanquished every single uh, army that came at them, they were prepared. Do you know that even as that edict had gone out saying that the Jews would be able to assemble and defend themselves, that they would be armed, there were, according to this account, people in the community who became Jews because they wanted to be on the side of right and probably because of fear of what would happen from something they may have done where they looked like they weren't in favor of the Jews and may have been killed themselves. You know, people will do things. And so as they came together and as this, um, as this played out, the Jews, however, though they were given the right for plunder, they did not choose to do that. And as a result of this experience, um, the, the, the celebration of Purim, Purim is um, a Jewish celebration. It's one of the minor holidays in, in the tradition. Um, Hats of Haman, I don't know if you're familiar with those little cookies. I think there are little cookies that they make. Anyhow, the, to, to, re, to remember the story when, when the Jews stood up and were able to overcome the threat against annihilation for them. Um, but that's not why I'm telling you the story. The reason I'm telling you the story is because in biblical understanding, this is all our story. And that every uh, major character in particular and the dynamics of the story are really written in our own hearts. And so I want to give you the opportunity to hear the archetype. First, we have King Xerxes, not a terrible person, morally compromised, but not terribly bright either. He has privilege and he has power. Surrounded by the reflection of his own values and his viewpoint, yes men all around him, and that he makes decisions that have consequences of life and death for others on a whim. Does that sound like anyone you know? I'll give you a minute. You can think, think through, run through, who, who would you say? Does it sound like some part of you? Is there some place in your life or in your history or in your, in your time on this planet that as part of your learning process, you learned that you were too thoughtless or careless with words or with actions or with, with your um, relationships in a way that perhaps everything around you supported your viewpoint, but it's only later that you learned that maybe there was harm caused by what you had done or said. King Xerxes may be something for you to think about. Haman the villain, he has a selfish ego. It enables him to plot total destruction of his enemy. He was given all the power to do it. Under what conditions is there a part of yourself capable of totally obliterating another person? Is this a time to review that, to make amends if you haven't already, or to forgive yourself one more time? The ego is beguiling and makes us think that we have right when we don't. And this is a time to heal that part of us as well. 
Mordecai, the hero. He's committed to his faith in only worshiping God. And as a result of that, he was willing to stand up. He was willing to stand up and, and I would say, remain standing rather than bow to someone of lesser deserving than the God that he knew and he worshipped. You see, it is per the particular gift of the oppressed to notice the vagaries of power and privilege. When your life can be dramatically changed, when loss can happen, when your very life can be ended because someone wields power or privilege unwittingly, you become very wise about what matters the most to you. What in life, what in life is worth fighting for and what kind of life is not worth living. And when you are able to know where you stand in that, on a daily basis, you can find a way, not, not easily, um, not without pain, not without stress or fear, but you begin to really know better than those who have the power know themselves at times how to defend and protect oneself. Mordecai knew how to do that. And he was um, a good man. He, he found the plot of, against the king and reported it but he was also wise and politically smart. He knew what it would do for him. It gave him an ace up his sleeve. It was a card to be played. You also learn how you can be in a world that is set up against you and make your plays where you can, right? He was willing to defy Haman and won. Dr. King said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. So when have you been willing to stand up for your principles, for what is right at personal cost or threat? Is that time now? Is this the time? Next Sunday, we have an opportunity following the service on June 14th from 2 to 4. Our Healing the Heart of America has a program we're offering. It's basically after George Floyd, learning from our pain. And it will be a Zoom call facilitated by Cindy Wigglesworth, an opportunity for us to process our feelings, our pain, speak to that, but also to explore meaning for our own lives and for the world. We hope that you'll join us then. This opportunity that it presents itself now is an opportunity for us to recognize that this, what we do now, matters. This is part of this divine integration I'm talking about. How will we show up as human beings? Esther, the queen, she came of age in the treacherous politics of the king's court, and she was called to a higher moral principle than just saving oneself. You even see her rotating around that. If I defy the king, I could be killed. And was able to rise in that moment, that huge obstacle, to integrate it into a higher purpose to where she could say fearlessly, and if I perish, I perish. Who is she to you? What is she in you? To save her people by speaking the truth she knew. When have you reached a turning point in your life where remaining silent is no longer possible? I'll give you a minute. Dr. King said, 
When you defend the actions of a racist by being compliant and complicit, you are a racist. Omission is still a lie. Indifference is permission. Silence is endorsement. Injustice is bred in cowardice and passivity. This is why we have come. This is the moment. Where do we stand? How do we receive this moment? How do we let it change us? Because everything that changes us changes the world. Let yourself feel. Let yourself rage. Let yourself deny for a while if you have to. Feel what you feel. Speak your truth and move with what is happening and needs to happen in this world. This is your opportunity. I leave you with the belief, Dr. King, that sadly had to be cast beyond his lifetime, but may finally serve us today, he said. I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. And today, my friends, from this stage, I tell you, it does. God bless you all. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.